I come before you today, as I do each year, still humbled by the opportunity to serve as your mayor, energized to tackle the most serious challenges we face to keep Chicago moving forward. Although we have accomplished much together, we have made Chicago a better place to live, work, and raise a family, there is still much more to be done. The challenges we face today are greater than ever. From the worst economic recession in modern times to an epidemic of violence that's needlessly killing all of our children. But even though we are facing difficult times, I am very confident we will get through them and that Chicago in this country will emerge stronger for just as we always have in the history of the United States of America. Our city is resilient and resourceful. The people of Chicago are tough, innovative, and can weather any challenge regardless of how great it is. After all, the people of Chicago, we built our city after the Chicago Fire 138 years ago. These tough times demand that we all roll up our sleeves. We double our commitment to address our challenges head on. Because the measure of government isn't how it performs when times are good, but how it responds when times are hard. I love Chicago. I want every person to succeed and have a good life. When we fall short, as we sometimes have, I want us to do better. It's important to me that the people of Chicago have confidence in the way I manage government, that they know we're doing our best to serve them honestly, openly, and fairly. We are up to the challenges ahead. I'm confident in that. Since I have been mayor, we improved our schools, driving up attendance, graduation rates, sending more of our young people to college. Test scores of many students improve year by year. But many schools still aren't good enough, and too many of our children uh, leave home each day to attend a school that doesn't deserve their needs. When we cut, when we cut over $2.5 billion in spending, implement new management improvements to protect taxpayers and do more with less. But many people feel burdened by higher taxes. In fact, in the midst of the worst economic times in modern history, people are upset about a lot of things. They're worried that they might lose their job or they lost their job, or their home, or their health insurance. They won't be able to pay off the student loans or even take a vacation. They want to know uh, we can get all we can from every tax dollar and manage government prudently, transparently. They want to know that their streets are safe. We have taken over 100,000 guns off our streets and reduced homicides from all-time highs. But gun violence continues to escalate. An epidemic of our youth on youth violence is tearing down families in some communities. We have worked with business, large and small, to create thousands of new jobs, both downtown and our communities. But for many people, the nation's recession has meant job loss, homes foreclosed, livelihoods threatened. Today, far too many in our city, our state, and across our country are struggling or out of work. It's heartbreaking to talk with someone who has been followed who's always followed the rules, has worked hard, has a wonderful family, paying their taxes, has lost their job, their home, or even their life savings. It's just as sad to meet someone who can't find a new job or help secure their future, or unemployed and just can't find a job. They're too old. People are anxious. They feel pressured by higher costs of living and higher taxes. If they have a job, they see everything going up, but their paychecks stay even. Our hearts go out to those businesses, large and small, that have difficulty meeting their payroll or getting credit to secure their future. And many are forced to lay off their workers or shut down altogether. Even today, major companies such as Boeing and U.S. Airways are laying off thousands of employees right now. At the same time, the recession has meant that government at all levels, and I include both the executive, legislative, and judicial branch, are challenged by slowing revenues, growing deficits, increasing demands for services. And looking to the future, 
some economists see signs of hope. Although most say there will continue to be layoffs in the private sector, as we recently seen. In Chicago, we have been hard hit by job loss in the private sector. The unemployment rate remains very high. But we will never abandon our workers or stand by them at the very time in Chicago families they need our help. And that's why we're working against the tide of job loss to create and retain good jobs for today and lay the foundation for the jobs of tomorrow. One job loss is one too many. We've invested in our neighborhood infrastructure to a greater extent than any other city, something that creates jobs and improves the quality of life. Through a tax increment financing program, we have leveraged more than $10 billion in private investment through less than $1.8 billion in public investments. These funds help create jobs, sustain businesses, and strengthen our communities. Through Chicago Leads, we're training our workers and students for jobs of the future while providing local employers with the skilled workers they need to compete in the global economy. Last year, the convention trade show attendance at McCormick Place was the highest it's been in three years. With a new website and neighborhood tourism program, we're stepping up our efforts to bring even more tourists and conventions to our city. We're helping the hardest hit workers take advantage of the earned income tax credit and property tax relief, both of which I've been promoting for years and have programs in every community. To strengthen our economy and, and stabilize our tax base, we're continuing our efforts to prevent foreclosure and create more and more affordable housing. We've been a national leader in keeping people in our homes. In 2003, the City of Chicago, with members of the City Council, we launched our Home Ownership Preservation Initiative to provide counseling to homeowners at risk, an effort we increased in 2009 when the nation's foreclosure crisis began. We will use millions in economic recovery funds to expand our foreclosure prevention efforts, and we're applying for additional economic recovery funds to do even more. Using well over $55 million in federal funding, our Neighborhood Stabilization Program will put up 2,500 vacant and foreclosed property back into use. Our latest five-year affordable housing plan announced in January, which was created in a difficult real estate environment, supports an additional 50,000 50, apartments and homes in the city of Chicago. Of course, one of the most important ways we're laying the foundation for the future is through the modernization of O'Hare International Airport. Together, O'Hare and Midway airports generate more than $45 billion in annual economic activity, support more than 540,000 jobs across the region. These are good jobs for hardworking people. Last year, we opened the first new runway since 1971 one step to help assure O'Hare remains vital in the future. Through our O'Hare modernization program, over 195,000 good jobs will be created. Over $18 billion in annual economic activity will be generated as we solidify Chicago role as an international global transportation leader. No one project we will undertake will create as many good jobs for Chicago. We need your support in its completion. We helped pass legislation in Springfield to build and repair our aging transportation and education infrastructure. I'd like to thank the labor leaders and civic leaders that joined together throughout the state. Our efforts will create good jobs. I want to thank Governor Quinn for signing it just this week. We've also supported by Washington, D.C., led by President Obama, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. We have moved very quickly to take advantage of the economic stimulus legislation enacted earlier this year. Together with our sister agencies, we hope to receive, we hope to receive over $1 billion in formula funding, applying for millions more in competitive grants. We believe it will save or create 16,000 jobs once we receive all of it. Already, it helps stimulate economic activity and it provides services for those in need. I should also point out that unlike any other city, 
we are partnering with the non-for-profit in our foundations community to make these dollars go far further for our taxpayers in our city. And for small businesses, especially our neighborhood businesses, many of which are struggling, we will continue to help those all we can to help them stay afloat in this serious economic crisis. Taken together with these steps are helping us work through these very difficult times, but it's not enough. We won't recover from the recession if we coast on our past efforts. Our challenge now is to seize the future and the opportunities it offers. Working together with business, labor, civic organizations, neighborhood organizations, we are now developing a plan to create, grow our economy, create jobs, grow our economy, basically look at the flow of revenue in the years ahead and what's going to happen in two or three years. We have a financial plan in 09, 10, 11, 12, the only city, only government that is looking now for four years. The plan, part of it will establish a program that will help small businesses grow and protect small businesses. This plan is more important than ever because many economists believe a new economy, and I quote, new economy, will emerge from the recession, and we better be ready for it. Most believe it will be a jobless recovery, meaning that companies will not hire back those who have been laid off. And that's why we must bring this new business, new industries, new opportunities to Chicago to create new jobs, and not just replace those that have been already been lost. Trends show that the new economy will be focused in several areas. Improvements in technology and communication will be key as well as increased demand for clean energy and green technology. There will be ongoing need to address a growing range of health care issues, including advances in medicine and pharmacy. Advances in science and biosciences will be important. So will more efficient transportation, increased physical and virtual speed in infrastructure. Of course, the new economy will require world-class education system. It will require lifelong learning and job retaining continually as the world economy evolves every few years. The good news is that Chicago is well positioned in each of these areas. To develop a workforce skilled in technology, we will work with leading technology companies around the world to launch a new job training program that will target unemployed Chicago residents. Our Green Jobs for All initiative will help ensure that Chicago has a trained workforce to meet the needs of growing clean energy sector in our city. There will be an addition to our efforts to retain workers, provide lifelong learning for the jobs of tomorrow. We will propose how to diversify our economy with jobs that specialize in financial services, tourism, bioscience, hospitality, transportation, health care, and other new economy business. Develop a more small neighborhood businesses we will launch a small business agenda in the communities and working with those businesses. To encourage innovation, entrepreneurship, we will create new partnerships between our business, labor, and academic communities so they can work together on long-term research and development projects. We will propose ideas to grow our convention and tourism industry, which we, we are worried as well as the rest of the country, which has been especially threatened during these very difficult economic times. We'll help close the digital divide, bring technology to under underserved communities. To improve our neighborhood economic stability, we will continue to offer programs that will help prevent foreclosures, offer affordable housing, including our ongoing plan to transform our public housing. We will continue to invest in new neighborhood infrastructure, both big and small, throughout our city. And I will announce the creation of a new Mayor's Advisory Council on the Economy. I will meet regularly with a panel of local economic, business, and labor experts so we can stay on top of emerging trends in the local economy and develop new strategies for the future collectively. Taken together, I believe these steps will help us put ahead of any other city in this country. So will the 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games, and my good friend Pat Ryan is here, co-chairman. She'll be named to host them. Remember, 
This is an American bid, and not just the city of Chicago, which is one reason President Obama has been so supportive, and I want to thank him for that in his, in his administration. I, along with many business, labor, community people, not only in the city, not only in the region, in the state, but throughout the country, have come together, and we believe, and we believe that at low risk to taxpayers, hosting these games will be ongoing economic benefit for Chicago for decades to come in the United States. The games will also leave a legacy of sport for future generations, as well as many lasting neighborhood improvements throughout our city. And another point that seems to get lost is that the 2016 has not spent a dime of taxpayers' money, the city, the county, the state, or the federal government. All the money that's been raised so far has been spent for 2016. The other countries, Japan, Brazil, and Spain, spend taxpayers' money, but here we did not. And if we get the games, tens of thousands of good jobs for Chicagoans will be created, with some starting as soon as next year. Chicago would benefit $13.7 billion in economic activity, generating $7 billion in wages for working people. With greater recognition around the world, the games will define Chicago even more clearly as a global destination for business and tourism alike. Leaders in other cities which hosted the Olympics, from Atlanta to Tokyo to Barcelona, Barcelona would tell you that the games benefited their economy for decades after the games were over. In most cases, host cities have benefited to the tune of nearly $750 million. To ensure that the entire city benefits from the games, the 2016 committee has signed an agreement with more than 75 community groups to assure the participation of minorities, disabled, and women-owned businesses in regards to the future. In addition, Chicago area foundations have committed millions for workforce development in our neighborhoods near their proposed venues. Still, I understand that many people have questions about the Olympics agreement and the 20, Chicago 2016 financial and other plans. They will be addressed fully. There will be hearings before the City Council. I've asked the 2016 committee to conduct public hearings covering all 50 wards, which have already begun. People's concerns and questions might be addressed so they have confidence in our plan that we can do it. But the nation's recession is only one way our quality of life is being challenged today. As a father and a grandfather, nothing pains me more than seeing Chicago children, and I say our children, killed. For me, the ending the violence is one of the most frustrating challenges I've faced. I've challenged the Chicago Police Department and they're doing an exceptional job every day to continue to update their strategies to protect our children and put behind bars of gangbangers and dope dealers who basically terrorize families and blocks and communities. I've asked them to be vigilant, and they are, and enforce even our city's curfew. I'd rather a parent be embarrassed by a knock on the door when a police officer brings a child home for violating curfew hours than for that knock on the door to be followed by the news that your child has been killed. We must all keep our children involved, and we have responsibilities in activities away from the gangs, guns, and drugs that adults have. I've asked Chris Millett of my office to become our point person on youth violence in ways to keep our children out of harm's way. Chris has broad experience in the area. Among other things, he has run a youth center, worked in public school system, served as a prosecutor with city. His job to integrate all of our city efforts with the community and other parts of government, both federal, state, and local, and figure out all the foundations, bring block clubs, and find some answer to keep your child safe. Toward that end, this summer, we're providing over 19,000 jobs to our children. We're offering almost 270,000 positive recreational and educational opportunities, and starting with after-school matters. This fall, for the first time, I want us to provide as many paid jobs 
after school as we can. In addition to offering our ongoing after school programs, if paid jobs aren't possible, volunteers or job shadowing opportunities are equally important. And I ask the business community and labor community to join with me on that. I cannot emphasize how important it is for parents to accept their responsibility. I ask your, all parents in the city, accept your responsibility for your children. If you can't accept that responsibility, pick up the phone and call 311. Don't be embarrassed. Just give us a call and say, I can't handle my child. I need help. We want to help them now. We don't want to help them when they become a victim. We don't want to help them become the offender. Just pick up that phone and admit it, I need help. And we will be there, and people will be there. Again, I want to plead with every person in every community to march with us. And if I'm not there, you march yourself. You say to the community, my family, my home, my block, my church, my school, my park belongs to me. It doesn't belong to that gangbanger or dope dealer. This is my child. I brought that child into the world. If it's not your child, the children on the block that Mercy Home does every day. Let's stand up and be counted as adults. And if you know about a crime, report it. If you know who's involved in a crime, report it. The code of silence, that's a code of silence, in many communities that protect the gang bangers and drug dealers is killing your children. And you must end it. That is the only way it's up to you to end the violence in the community. Something as simple as using a cell phone, and everybody has a cell phone in Chicago, except maybe the mayor. Uh, <laughs> everybody has cell phones. Just keep, pick up that cell phone, have it. Record, report a crime, and you can solve a crime. And everybody has phones. I don't care where you go in Chicago. And I pledge to you that we will never give in to the gangbangers and dope dealers. And people said, maybe we can't solve the drug war. We've been there since 1970. America can't do it. But if we ever give up to our drug dealers, go south of our border and talk to the president of Mexico. They haven't given up. They're fighting the struggle for democracy, for their country. If we give this up, those gangbangers community will spread not one community to another. Don't think it's isolated in the community. It's all over the nation. It's in the wealthier, it's in the poor, it's in the middle class. Drugs is basically destroying our communities and destroying our children. And that's why uh, I ask each and every one of you to really understand and take a pledge that we'll never give in to the gangbangers and drug dealers who we'll perpetuate violence and don't give a damn about whether people live or die in a community. They ra rather murder your child than have their profit and power taken away, and they've done that. This is my corner. This is my drugs, and this is my money. And I don't care what your child is. I don't care the race. I don't care what religion. I don't care it's my cousin. This is my money. And that's why we keep meeting and marching with faith-based law enforcement, community leaders all across the city, day and night. We need their ideas and yours for ending the violence. And this violence has to end. The challenge is, is that we're now in the summer months when the risk of violence all across our country rises. While the number of homicides in Chicago remains far lower than a decade ago, during warm weather, it can easily increase overnight or on weekend just like that. And one death is one too many. We are not in a foreign country. We're in the United States of America, and we have to understand that. We have our young men and women fighting overseas for democracy. We have a responsibility to allow democracy and protect all our children in every city in America. And with that concern, the Chicago Police Department will permanently reassign 100 more 150 more police officers from desk jobs to street patrol. And this summer, 450 officers are being reassigned to street duty. They have created new strategy teams uh, that are quickly sent to communities in gang and drug hotspots. 
through federal economic stimulus funding, they're seeking to hire another 400 police officers who I will insist be assigned directly to street patrol. I have also challenged them to increase their efforts to better coordinate with crime prevention efforts with the City Human Service Program. Many families that police officers come in contact with needed counseling and other support. The department is also stepping up its efforts to find and confiscate guns. And we lead the way in America to confiscate guns in the city of Chicago. And I want to thank all those police officers for getting out of their car and going into another car or stopping an individual and picking up another gun. That saves another child in our city. And since I've, made, since I've been mayor, I've made confiscating guns a, a priority. This summer, we will hold our annual, now think of that, in America, we have to hold an annual gun turn-in on August 15th to get automatic weapons, 357 Magnum, you name it, it's amazing, off of our streets. We're asking people to turn the guns in, ask a mother to go under the bed, go in the drawer, check your child if they're carrying a gun, a shotgun or a pistol, anything. Take the gun out of the house. Take the gun out of the car. And August 15th is our date. We're always standing against those who want more guns to be available across our nation. And people think guns are going to solve anything. They don't. We will be very vigilant in Springfield and Washington, D.C. to enact reasonable, and I said reasonable, gun legislation, including reenacting our nation's ban on assault weapons. Just think, one of your sons or daughters who comes back from the military can buy better assault weapons in stores in America than they give in the Army and all the military. That can only happen in America. Why is that taking place today? We will continue to fight legal challenges to our city's ban on handguns. So far, attacks from those who want to throw it out have failed. The case may end up in the Supreme Court. And taken together, we believe many strategies will help to prevent violence in our city. If they don't, we'll implement new ones and we'll admit it's not working. We're always open to better ideas and ways to protect our city and our children. We also need your thoughts on our city budget, which has been dramatically impacted by this recession and all the businesses have and labor, they know that. It hasn't been easy, but without our ongoing efforts to cut spending, improve management, things will be far worse than today. Families across the city are already bearing the responsibility of a tough economy, making difficult choices in their homes and sacrificing every day. They're tightening their belts to get by and weather this storm. And we must continue to do all we can, and we have to take tough choices still lie ahead. And that's because even with these steps we have taken, Chicago, like any other major city, foresees significant budget shortfalls ahead as a direct result of this depression, recession. And that's why we'll continue to demand more from our employee in cutting where we must. Remember, there are 6,000 fewer non-sworn city employees today than I took office. During 2008, we cut spending by $190 million. Since I've been mayor, we have cut more than $2.5 billion in spending. As a result, these positive steps, because we, we used some of the reserves funds available to help us through our asset leases, last year we'll be able to balance our budget without raising property taxes. And since then, the nation's recession has worsened. Our monthly revenues continue to drop, and we're very concerned about that. We expect this year's revenue shortfall to be between $250 and $300 million while the projected budget shortfalls for the next several years will be just as challenging and reaching into hundreds of millions. Already this year, we've implemented $47 million in spending reduction, but we must cut more to close the deficit. We need your advice about next steps, and that chance will come during our upcoming budget hearings. Remember, at the very time that we have been able to avoid major layoffs, increasing property taxes, and making major service cuts so far, other cities have already done that and are cutting deeper and deeper, and that's what we worry about in the city of Chicago. We all know that unless we reduce the cost of personnel, we cannot balance this year's budget. 
personnel costs comprise over 80 percent, 80 percent of our operating expenses. And that's why it's so important to require the city's top employees, starting with me and my staff and our commissioners, to take 15 unpaid days this year. That means I and about 3,700 non-union employees will take a pay cut of more than 11 percent for the remainder of the year. I would never ask any employee to sacrifice something I wasn't willing to give up first. I believe it's far better for employees to make salary concessions than it is for them to have no job at all. As you know, our plan, and we've also worked to get the city's union partners, Dennis Gannon, Tom Villanova, many of the labor leaders that went to their meeting, their union halls, and said, this is the problem. There's a recession. The money's not coming into the city. How can we save your job, your families? Some may have their children going to private schools. Some are going to college, they have student loans. These are real families, working families. And to me, to lay them off would again put them in the unemployment rolls. Their homes, everything else, their life has changed. And you can't do that. Everybody's in the same boat. No one's outside this boat, whether it's the mayor or anybody else. We have to be in it. If we're not in it, then we're not going to survive. And that's why I deeply appreciate these leaders going to their members, educating their members, and giving them the facts of life. And, I, and let's give them a round of applause and thank them. <laughs> Starting in early February of this year, we started working with them. They came to the table because they knew we had problems. Since February, we've been working on this. It isn't last week or the week before. And that's why many meetings and conversations and people work. The 25 out of the 27 unions, I point to have agreed to be part of the solution and not of the problem, because they understand it, because their brothers and sisters in the private sector are being laid off and reduced the cost. And again, personally thank them because they understand the financial hardships of the taxpayers of the city, and they understand what's going on. And again, I, I really thank them for their commitment and leadership, and that's what this is all about. Unfortunately, the leaders of two unions would not reach an agreement so far. We are forced then to lay off some of their members today, and that's very hard for me, because these people are good workers. They come to work every day. They have their families. Some take public transportation. Some come in a carpool all over the city. And to see them laid off, but this is not going to be a political game. This is going to be no blaming anybody else. They believe, those unions believe, that layoffs is better than any concessions. And that's a democratic process, and that's what they told me. And I understand that. I respect them for that. But that's up to them, and that's up to their leadership. I did not want this to happen. And they could have been avoided, and I firmly believe that. I feel very sorry for them and their families, because at 5 o'clock, 4.30, they're off. And that is a very, very sad comment as we sit here. Because we wish to remain, maintain our safety. Our plan did not include furloughing and laying off either sworn or fire officers. And that is an issue, because 70 percent of our budget, fire police and emergencies, they're not in the boat. We're in the boat. Dennis is in the boat. Manager's in the boat. They're not in the boat. They have to come back in the boat. And we will continue our contract negotiations for them. We're asking them to get back in the boat. Talk to your taxpayers. Talk to your neighbor. And they have to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. I've asked all the other employees to help us and their union leadership have to help them. A year ago, we had 16% on the table to the fire and police union. 16% over five years, understand that fifth year could be looked at. They rejected that, but the thing they rejected is they rejected it. They didn't tell their members. They didn't tell the firemen. They didn't tell the policemen. They didn't tell no one. They said it wasn't enough. I tried to explain, this is an economic crisis. And when they pulled it off, of course, they marched around City Hall. They blamed me. Who else are you going to blame? They weren't going to blame their labor leaders. Misinformation. Labor leaders who stood up, explain them. People can understand that. 
And so we're going to go into arbitration with them. And I've asked every employee to understand this is one city. It's one city, and all of us have to come together. It can't be them and us. And that's why this recession is so serious. Some may ask why we don't use all the reserve funds. And people ask me that from the asset leases to balance this year's budget, instead of asking employees to give up more. I wish I could use everything right now and say, OK, 10 is going to be a great year. But so far, 10 will not be a great year. I wish we could do it, but it would be irresponsible to use all the funds in one year at one time. We have a four-year financial plan. And that four-year financial plan includes growth and looking and bringing people back and things like that. And yes, even salary increases later on, because that's important. You need a four-year financial plan. Because we foresee the impact of the recession. We knew it was coming. Continuing the next several years, along with continued weak revenues, the responsible approach is to preserve these funds so we can use them now and over the next several years to help balance the city's budget. And that's what the plan is all about, a three to four year plan. Like everyone, people say spend it right now and nothing for next year or nothing for 11 or 12. They're making a very bad mistake. And like everyone else, we are concerned about rising taxes even in Illinois. People are rightfully angry, and they're getting angry at what they perceive as the top executives both in government and business or government employees, benefiting at the very time they're suffering, and you're hearing from them. We must show the taxpayers of Chicago that during these tough economic times, we always put their interests first. Even today, it is reported that a major Wall Street firm that benefited from the bail, bailout funds is planning to give its employees a fat pay packages, an increase of nearly 50% over the last year. Now, people are going to get upset with that. $4.5 billion? They, don't have, they lost their home. They're losing their salaries. Goldman Sachs is saying that? This, people don't understand it. And that's what you have to tell people. You have to realize what the country's all about. And you wonder why people are so angry when they read that headline. Then the next headline is layoffs and layoffs. Today, I want to challenge the leadership in each one of our sister agencies, Chicago Public Schools, Chicago City Colleges, Chicago Transit Authority, Chicago Housing Authority, Chicago Park District, to do what we've already done at the city. Ask our top executives to take furlough days and make, uh, make some more, some other financial sacrifice. Further, I've instructed my staff and sister agencies to do all we can to avoid any tax or any fee increase this year. We are especially concerned that property tax relief, our circuit breaker plan for hard hit homeowners and renters, have not yet been enacted in Springfield. Without it, some people who can least afford to pay their bills will be hit with higher than expected tax bills. Additional relief may be needed for some homeowners and impacted by the, this year's city reassessment. And I asked the assessor, how can they increase assessments? And you can talk to any homeowner, you can talk to any developer, the values are going down, unfortunately, in the city, in the metropolitan area. We need your help to make sure the legislature enacts and the governor signs some form of additional property tax relief this year. As always, we encourage every homeowner who receives an assessment or property tax bill to appeal it right away if they believe it's higher than their neighbors. We will continue to challenge those large businesses in Chicago that always seek to avoid paying their fair share of property taxes. Remember, 50 to 70 percent of the property tax bill goes for education, fulfill the responsibility the state doesn't. So these corporations should at least pay their real estate taxes when it helps education here in the city of Chicago. I've already announced that I've instructed my staff to review the parking meter lease to determine how we can make it work better for the people of Chicago. This was a very, very good financial transaction for our city, but mistakes were made in the implementation. And I assure you, they're being addressed right now. At my instruction, the installation of pay boxes have been expedited, a step that I hope will make things easier for people. I also want to ensure people that I'm well aware of the concern over misconduct of any city employee, because that goes your hard-earned taxpayers' money. In government, we are committed to, to do whatever we can
for people to have confidence in all of our actions. But people also need to know they have worked very hard to reform any operation, prevent any misconduct by anyone. The Office of Inspector General. We created the Office of Compliance and work very closely with employee training to prevent any misconduct in the first place. We continue to work with the federal government to implement new procedures to better protect against improper hiring. Before the last campaign for mayor, I proposed and I signed an executive order under which I voluntarily decided not to accept any campaign contribution from any company that have any city contracts. It remains in effect for me. We have put city contracts online for greater transparency. We've instituted a whistleblower protection law that prohibits the city from unjustly firing and disciplining employees who report wrongdoing. We're imposing increased penalties for city employees found guilty of misconduct. We've created the Independent Police Review Authority to investigate police officers accused of abusing their own authority and breaking the law. Still, I've asked my staff to go further. They're drafting an executive order which will codify our commitment to prevent abuse of the hiring system. It must be abundantly clear that we continue to be serious about addressing this challenge. To bring even further greater transparency to government, I've asked that more information be put online such as members of boards and commissions. We will soon announce an improved web page specifically devoted to information about the economic stimulus package. To bring further greater openness, I've asked the Ethics Board to post online all economic disclosure statements that are filed with the city. I agree with the city clerk, Miguel Diwali, to step that puts statements on financial interest online so you taxpayers know everything about your public officials. And out of my concern about the difficulties in regulating video poker, we will propose an ordinance that penalizes businesses that abuse the system in the city. We will continue to closely monitor our financial position to ensure we are doing all we can to protect taxpayers and stay ahead of the recession. Of course, preparing for the new economy hinges on one important step. Chicago must have the best education system in the nation, and that's what we strive for. We cannot accept anything less. A good education is not only the pathway out of poverty, it is Chicago's plan to economic security and growth. And we won't be the best unless we raise the bar, raise the bar every day, set higher expectations, and demand more from every child in our city. Even with the year-to-year -year progress many of our students at individual schools have made, I know that we have a long way to go. Not enough elementary students graduate into high school ready for more demanding coursework. Too many of our students, and still don't graduate from high school, go on to success in college. Even though a majority of our African-American graduate high schools, far too many drop out. We cannot afford to lose one child of the most, mo most important generation for this year. We must take all our schools to the next level. To help do that, there needs to be a full discussion of whether the current statewide test best measures a student's potential in the real world. Remember, it is the state that develops and mandates the test for the state of Illinois not one for the city of Chicago, it's statewide. I've challenged our school leaders to continue to open new charter schools, optional schools, new reorganized public schools, but our priori priority must be improve our traditional, our old neighborhood schools. Have people have confidence that the children can get a good quality education a block, two blocks, or three blocks from their school. The majority of our students attend neighborhood schools. We owe them a good quality education. And that's why we must stay focused on teaching the basics in the classroom, reading, math, and science. This fall, we'll open four new elementary schools, one new high school, which is a major accomplishment in this economy. As I said many times, we must do far more to turn around our troubled schools, starting with our high schools. With the support from Chicago business community, many efforts are in place and are working. The question now is, what more can be done? As we recognize for many years, the modern economy, a high school diploma is no longer the minimum for students need for success. A college diploma is. Still our students are yet again demonstrating how much can we accomplish when we truly believe in our children. And that's what Mercy Home does every day. 
Now it's up to us to take to the next step. In closing, I want to say one more thing. I live and breathe Chicago. I think I got the best job in America. I want what's the best for our city and every person that lives in that. I've devoted my entire life to building a stronger city. With your support and the support of all of our citizens, I believe we can accomplish even greater things. Neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, community by community, of course, there will always be more to accomplish, and yes, there is. And never be status, satisfied with the status quo. But if we remain confident, if we remain optimistic, and we continue to say we can work together, labor management, non-for-profit, and the government can work together, we can get through these tough economic times. Our parents, our grandparents have done this during the Great Depression. Let's have more confidence in one another. Let's really believe that the spirit of Chicago that what we're doing today carry on another generation, that we're not going to turn our back on the unemployed. We're not going to turn back on the younger generation or a generation of children born in poverty, that this country lifted everybody up, and we have to hold our hands for everybody. It doesn't matter who they are. And I'm convinced, with all of us here in the entire city, we're going to get through this. In the long run, maybe we'll be better. It's sad to see hardships. It's sad to see people suffering. And we must understand we have responsibility, not just a legal responsibility, but I believe a moral responsibility. Just like Mercy Home had that moral responsibility 100 and some years ago to take care of our children. Let's keep the mission and let's keep it going. Thank you very much.